Hello, and welcome to the second lecture of semantics. So, in the first, uh, in the first lecture, we spent uh, quite a while talking about uh, why we would want such a thing as semantics at all. And in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to look at our first language, imaginative, imaginatively named L1, and uh, we're going to actually see what this language looks like and start giving a semantics to it. So you can see by example how, how to define an operational semantics for a programming language. Okay, so what is, uh, what is L1? So L1 is going to be a very, very simple imperative language. So it's going to be a language with store locations um, that contain integers, and we're going to have expressions like arithmetic expressions, conditional uh, Boolean expressions, uh, and conditionals and while loops along with uh, assignments and sequencing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, uh, be able to write small while loop programs, which are sort of your kernel imperative program, and uh, uh, calculate things. So here's an example. So in this program, what we're going to do is we're going to initialize the location L2 to 0. And then we're going to say, while the contents of L1 are greater than or equal to one, what we're going to do is we, we are going to add L2 to L1, L1 and then decrement uh, L1. And then we're going to repeat this as long as L1 is greater than or equal to one. So as long as it's greater than zero. And so we're starting with, and we do this in the initial store, L1 has uh, three and L2 has zero. So if these are the initial values of these two variables or locations, um, what we're going to do is we're going to set L2 to zero, which will do nothing because L2 was already zero. And then on each trip, what we're going to do uh, around this loop, what we're going to do is we're going to say, is L1 greater than or equal to one? And since L1 is three, it is, it is greater than one. And so now we're going to say, okay, L2 is going to be incremented. So we're gonna take the contents of L2 and add L1 to it. So in this case, we're going to take zero and add three to it. So now L2 is three. And so now we're going to decrement L1 so that L1 is two. And now we jump back up to do the test. So is two greater than or equal to one? Yes, it is. So we're going to add two to L2 again. And since L2 was already, uh, was already three, what it's going to do is it's going to store five now. So L2 went from three to three plus two or five, okay? And so now down here, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, L1 was, uh, was two. And so now we're going to decrement it again so that it's one. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to do the test. Is L1 or uh, one greater than or equal to one? Well, yes, just barely, but yes. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to add that one to, uh, to L2. And since L2 was already five, what's going to happen is that uh, it will be incremented from five to six. And so now we do the decrement again. So L1 will now go from one to zero. We do the test, zero greater than or equal to one? No, it's false. So now we finish and our store will change from L1 maps to three to, and L2 maps to zero to L1 maps to zero and L2 maps to six. So we've added up the numbers uh, uh, from, uh, from one to three in reverse order. So we added three, two, one, and we got six. So this is, uh, this is a pretty basic imperative language. Um, but now let's try to specify what the language is formally. And so what we're going to do is first, we're going to give a grammar for this language. Um, and so the way that we specify a grammar is first, we give some basic operations, and then we state how you can form new operations from old ones. So our basic operations are going to be Boolean literals like true and false. Um, all the integer levels, you know, from negative, negative uh, one, zero, one, two, negative two, three, negative three, four, negative four, um, as large or small as you like. And then you, you, we saw that in addition to these uh, Boolean tests and integers, we were also able to uh, 
talk about locations or addresses. And so what we're going to do is we're going to define some infinite but countable set of locations. So we're going to say we have some set of locations, L, L0, L1, L2, and we're just going to write this dot 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 to mean that there's a uh, uh, there's a countable set of them. So for every for every natural number, there is a, some location, and the point is that the set of locations uh, is a sort of an abstract type of addresses. So in assembly language, location and integers are just the same thing. They're both 64-bit numbers. But in our, uh, in our language, we're going to keep them separate. So we're going to say that the integers are the mathematical integers, and we're going to say that the locations are an abstract set of elements whose uh, cardinal and the set of locations has the same cardinality as the natural numbers, but it's not the same set. So that way we can get a type error if we try to use a location where we want an integer or vice versa. So the only thing we'll do with locations is sort of um, use them as uh, uh, addresses for the store and we're also going for the memory and we're also going to be able to test locations for equality. Okay, so once we've got loca uh, locations and integers and booleans, which are going to be sort of the primitives of the language, we also need to be able to do things with them. And so we're going to have operations like uh, addition and comparison. So in fact, we'll only have addition and greater than or equal to. Uh, and so with these op the way that we put these op uh, operations together is by using expressions. And so the expressions are going to be our integers, they're going to be our booleans. So just as promised, what we've got are the uh, the basic expressions are going to be uh, numbers and booleans, and now we can combine them. So if we have two expressions, e1 and e2, we can form another expression, e1 op e2. So this is either going to be, since op, op is either plus or greater than or equal to, this one says, I have an expression e1, and if I have an expression e2, then e1 plus e2 is an expression, and e1 greater than or equal to e2 is an expression. And likewise, we can do conditional tests. So we, if you if e1, e2, and e3 are expressions, then if e1, then e2, else e3 is also an expression. Okay, so that gives us arithmetic, booleans, and conditionals, and we also have the ability to store a new new value into a location. So L colon equal to E means evaluate E and assign the result to L. So if, you've, if you remember in OCaml, you, you were introduced to references, this is extremely similar syntax to that. So, and likewise, if you have a location, you can find out what value that it's storing with bang L. And once we have these basic expressions, we can also sequence them. So we have skip, which is the uh, uh, no-op operation, no-op uh, expression, and E1 semicolon E2 says execute E1 and then execute E2. Or if E1 and E2 are both expressions, the sequencing E1 semicolon E2 is an expression. Um, and then finally, we have while loops. So if E1 and E2 are expressions, then while E1 do E2 is an expression. And so uh, this, this grammar, this uh, uh, BNF grammar, tells us how to generate all of the expressions. So it's, uh, it says you start with the basic, uh, basic expressions, uh, and then any, any other uh, expression can be formed by like sort of uh, successively applying uh, one of these grammatical constructions to form new uh, to form new uh, uh, to form new and larger expressions. And so what we're going to do is we're going to write L1 for the set of all expressions. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, how these expressions evaluate. So I said when I was describing each of these uh, uh, each of these expressions, I said informally, oh yes, L colon E is doing some assignment. Um, if E1, then E2, else E3 is a Boolean conditional. Um, but the thing to notice is that uh, right now all we have is the syntax. This uh, This is like sort of um, inert data and it doesn't do anything. 
So in order to actually give it the semantics so that it has the behavior that I, I claimed it should have, what we have to do is we have to actually formally specify what each of the, how, how these expressions evaluate. And so the tool that we use to do this are what are called transition systems. So in uh, discrete mathematics, you'll be looking at uh, uh, regular expressions and finite automata, and you'll see, okay, well, we have a, a language of regular expressions, and you can compile them down to finite automata, which are states which take transition steps. And then, then the idea is that if you, ha if you have a string, it matches against a, a regular expression. If it's automaton, ticks along through consuming the string and ends up in a final state. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a very similar idea when we, when we formulate the, uh, the semantics of our, uh, of our programming language. And so the fundamental tool that we're going to use are transition systems. And so a transition system is just a set of configurations and a binary relation on configurations. And you can read this as the first configuration steps to the second configuration. So we write this as an ear, uh, arrow. And then what we're going to say is if we have, we're, we're going to write C arrow C prime to use this relation in an infix way. So we're saying C steps to e, C prime means the state C can make a transition to the state C prime. Or in other words, C and C prime are members of the transition relation. And so this arrow is sometimes called the reduction or the transition relation or the evaluation relation. Um, but the point is that it takes machine configurations and tells you that one state can make a transition to the other. and um, the idea behind operational semantics is that what we're going to do is the states of our uh, transition relation are going to be the configurations of the machine. And so what we're going to do is to formulate, so when we talked about what these uh, programs did, we informally referred to, oh yes, when I do L1 colon E, I'm going to store the results of E in the a memory at location L. And in order to formulate that precisely, what we have to do is we have to actually say what the store is mathematically. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that a store or a state is a finite partial function from the set of locations to the integers. So for example, here we have a finite par partial function which says L1 maps to 7 and L3 maps to 23. And so the other the other way of, the way of thinking about a finite partial function is that um, L, we we s is a function that for each location um, gives you the integer that it stores. And when we say that it's finite, what we're saying is that um, this function is undefined everywhere except for a finite number of locations. And so if you think about this in terms of a program memory, so if you're writing a C program or something, what you're going to do is as you execute your program, you're going to allocate uh, blocks of memory with malloc. And at any point in the execution, so after a finite number of steps, you can only have evaluate called invoked malloc a finite number of times. And so the the store or memory is going to have a finite number of objects in it. And so that's a sort of what we're capturing here. We're saying our store has a finite collection of addresses that are, uh, that are uh, initialized with a value, and each of those locations stores an integer. So, the, and the way that we'll write these uh, finite partial functions is typically by just listing the, listing the locations that are defined and the values that they're stored that they're at that location. And so, if you have one of these uh, uh, stores, um, this store paired with an expression gives you a configuration or machine state. And so, what we're going to do is we're going to give a transition relation which says, um, I take a pair of an uh, expression and a, uh, a store to a new expression and a new store. So 
for assignment, say what we're going to want to do is we're going to say, okay, if I set L1 to 5, then I'll take this store and I'm going to update the memory so that L1 now points to 5, in is mapped to 5 in the, in the resulting uh, uh, store. And so what you can see here is that uh, the con transition relation has a bit of a functional programming flavor where you were saying, um, yes, if you give me the program and the current state, I'll give you the next program and its next state. So the, the semantics is making this memory explicit so that you're we're explicitly passing in the initial state and getting out the next state. And this makes it much easier to prove things about uh, uh, a program because you can look at the uh, you can look at the configurations and you know exactly what the memory is. Um, and the one thing, the one caveat though, is that up here we called the transition relation a relation, and so there's no requirement when you have a, a transition relation that there's only one. St successor state for an expression uh, for a configuration so say in a concurrent program there's a lot of possible uh, a, a lot of possible executions depending on whether you execute one thread or the uh, other thread in each step and so we we have to formulate uh, uh, transition relations as relations rather than transition functions and so the idea behind these transitions is that they are single computation steps so what we're going to do is we're going to say that if we set L to two plus the contents of L when L is three, each of these uh, transition steps is going to do a tiny atomic amount of computation. So in the first step, what we're going to do is we're going to look up the contents of L and we'll go from L is two plus contents of L to L is going to be set to two plus three. And then this two plus three is going to be evaluated in one step to L is set to five. And then we're going to uh, say set L to five and we're going to update the three to a five. And so in a sequence of one, two, three steps, we're going to get to a value, which is a configuration from which there is no step. And so again, this is where the relational character of a transition relation comes into play. Because um, when you have a value, there's no more evaluation to be done. So there's no, we're going to say there's no transition from it in the relation. And so we're writing this as um, an arrow with a slash through it to say, well, I don't have any transitions from skip to anything. And so what we're going to do is we're going to call the values, um, the expressions like booleans and integers and skip from which there's no more sensible evaluation. And so we're going to say, uh, we're going to say aside from the values that a, uh, a configuration can get stuck. So ES is stuck if it's not a value and there's no transition for it. So we want two plus true, true to be stuck. And so again, here's another application of the transition relation being a relation. So, uh, what we're doing is we're saying, well, we don't want to say what two plus true should be. We want to say that's a sort of erroneous computation. And the way that we're going to model it is by simply not putting it into the transition relation. So we're going to say, okay, if you see two plus true, there's no, there's no uh, transition from it. And so therefore you're in a stuck state. There's no way to evaluate any further. And also you're not a value. So you're not done with the computation. And so we can use these stuck states to model uh, to model sort of ill-formed programs, or model what to do when you see an ill-formed program. Okay, and so I said, oh, we're going to put things into the relation on the previous slide. So the question is, how can you do that? And so the way that we uh, the way that we uh, uh, formulate semantics is by using what are called inference rules. And so uh, the idea behind an inference rule is that it tells you um, how to put things into this transition relation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to have a collection of rules and these rules are going to have some base cases. So we're going to say, put n1 plus s2 steps to n 
um, in the transition relation when n is equal to n plus n1 plus n2. And likewise for uh, for operator expressions, if you see a pair of numbers, n1 and n2, let's say three or five, what we want that to step to is we want to step we want it to step to to whatever Boolean uh, is the result of comparing n1 and n2. And so far, what we're doing right in these two rules is we're seeding our configuration relation. So if we we're going to say any any expressions and configurations which match these rules, we want to we want to put them into the into the configuration relation. And so. Um, when you take prologue, what you're going to see is you're going to see something very similar to this. You're going to see, uh, you're going to define a program as a set of rules, and you'll match a term against the rules, and that'll tell you uh, tell you what's in the uh, what's in the relation that you define in prologue. And these these inference rules work very similarly to that. So. If you have an expression three greater than or equal to five, we're going to say three greater than or equal to five, um, and any store s is going uh, paired with the configuration false, and that same store s that's going to be in this transition relation. And okay, so for uh, for these for these uh, basic arithmetic and Boolean comparison expressions, those seed the relation. And then how do we add things to the relation? And the way that we do this is in a way that's actually quite similar to the uh, what we saw with the grammars. What we're going to say is, th uh, we're going to say that if E1 comma S steps to E1 prime comma S prime, so if this pair E1 S, E1 prime S prime is in this relation arrow, then what we're going to do is we're going to say that e1 op2 comma s step transitions to e1 prime op e2 s prime that's going to be in the relation so we're going to say so these these horizontal lines say well if the top thing is in the relation then put the bottom thing into the relation also and so what we're what we're doing is we're going to say all right um when you ha and so the, another way of reading this is we're going to say to evaluate e1 op e2 see if e1 transitions so if uh, e1 steps to e1 prime then e1 op2 will step to e1 prime op e2 and so you you need to you need to read these rules with a sort of double vision so you, you want to say that uh, um, if this configuration is in the uh, transition relation, then the bottom thing is in the relation. And you so that's a sort of top-down reading. And you also want to do a sort of bottom-up reading, where we say, if the uh, uh, in order to evaluate the thing on the bottom, check to see if the thing on the top can, can evaluate. And so um, now, if we're evaluating these composite expressions like e1 up to e2, if uh, the op1 rule says, well, if e1 steps to e1 prime, then e1 op e2 will step to e1 prime op e2. And the op2 rule is going to say, well, if e1 is already a value, so we have v op e2, then it's going to step to v op e prime 2 when e2 steps to e2 prime and with s going to s prime. So the other thing to notice here is uh, when you're evaluating the uh, the second component of an operator, and if the store is updated, then the uh, store will be updated in the larger expression as well. And so these four rules will tell you how to evaluate sort of basic arithmetic operations. Um, and the way that we use these rules is to uh, try to look for derivations of transitions. So we're going to say, can we build a tree that starts with the expression we want to evaluate and uses using these rules goes to uh, goes to like the base rules of op plus or op greater than or equal to. So for instance, if we're trying to add Two plus, find it, find out what two plus three plus six plus seven evaluates to. Well, the way that we can do this is uh, we can use our semantics to prove this. Now, you, uh, now when you see this, you're immediately going to think, okay, two plus three plus six plus seven that should be eighteen. But what we want to do is we want to consult our language definition to say that this uh, to to prove that our uh, our definition is correct. 
Um, so these rules are defining our programming language and once we have this definition in hand, we have to check that the definition makes sense. Um, so we can use our rules to do so to find out what the transitions are. So for 2 plus 3 plus 6 uh, plus 7, then the op1 rule, so that's what this one right here that says e1 op2, that matches this expression 2 plus 3 plus 6 plus 7 because we've got an operator right here. And the op1 rule will say, okay, well, um, if, two, if 2 plus 3 can step to something, then that's in the relation. And since we have 2 plus 3, so a value and a value uh, with a plus, the op plus rule applies. And it says, well, uh, n1 plus n, n2, n is in the relation when n is equal to n1 plus n2. And so 2 plus 3 is going to be in the relation with 5. So 2 plus 3 will step to 5. And so our, that's what our semantics says. And now uh, we can form a second derivation, which says, well, if you have 5 plus 6 plus 7, this will, this will, uh, this will step. Uh, this, this is a composite expression. And so our op2 rule says, well, ignore the value and see what the 6 plus 7 does. And our op plus rule will say, well, 6 plus 7 is adding two literal numbers, so that's going to go to 13. And so we have the op plus rule and then the op2 rule, and that tells us that 5 uh, plus 6 plus 7 will evaluate to 5 plus 13. And then finally, when you have 5 plus 13, we know that that's in the relation with 18 because our op plus rule says 5 plus 13 should be in the relation with the result of adding those two numbers. And so each of these transitions is going to say, well, is going to, rep each of these derivations represents one step of the evaluation relation. Um, and so we have a sequence of evaluate, evaluation steps that says 2 plus 3 plus 6 plus 7 steps to 5 plus 6 plus 7, and then 5 plus 6 plus 7 steps to 5 plus 13, and then 5 plus 13 steps to 18. And so the thing to notice um, is that there were actually three derivation uh, trees for the evaluation relation, um, one for each of uh, actual... <laughs> Uh, step of the reduction. So if we uh, if we wrote this out, so we have two plus three plus six plus seven. What we're going to say is that this thing steps to five plus seven. And then this thing here will step to 5 plus 13. And then this thing here is going to step to 18. And so what we've got are three reduction steps. So I wrote it, I wrote it uh, um, in, a, in a style where we say, okay, this thing steps to this thing, this thing steps to that thing, that thing steps to that thing. And so what we've actually got are th three elements of our reduction relation. And so this is the this is one, one element of the re re reduction relation. This is a second and this is a third. And so what we're doing is we're saying that a program can take a step to have a, 2 plus 3 plus 6 plus 7 uh, can evaluate to a value because we have three steps of the evaluation relation. The first one evaluating the left argument, the second one evaluating the right argument, and the third one taking the sum of the left and the right arguments. And the way that we showed that things were in this evaluation relation arrow was by building these derivation trees, uh, 2 plus 3 and uh, uh, plus 6 plus 7. We had one derivation tree, another derivation tree over here, and a third derivation tree over here. Okay, so now what we can do is we can add 
some more uh, reduction rules for each of the each of the remaining constructions in the language. So now we can talk about store and sequencing and things like this. So the way that we dereference an address or location is by looking it up in the store. And because the store is a partial function, we say that derefl steps to n when l is in the domain of the store, so when it's defined, and s of l is equal to n. So remember that because s is a, a partial function, we have to check that it's actually in the domain of the partial function, so it's defined, and then we, then we can do the lookup. And if we have a, we can do an assignment where we say, okay, L gets set to N, it will step, uh, st starting from a store S, will step to a new configuration where the return value is skip and the store is S plus L mapped to N. Um, and what this S plus L arrow N notation means is take the old partial function S and replace whatever you had for the location L with the, with, the, with the mapping to N. And so we restrict this to saying, well, L had to already be in the domain of S. And so what this means is that S maps uh, L to something, and we're going to update that with a new, with a new, uh, with a new, uh, with a new value n. So basically we get back the same partial function as s except that at location l we're going to we're going to map it to the value n. And so we're going to use this plus notation to to write down updated partial partial functions. And another way we could have written this is we're going to say that uh, let's go down right here. So we're going to say s plus l maps to n is going to is going to equal s prime where s prime of l prime is equal to um, if l prime is equal to l then we return n and otherwise we return s of l prime And so, so the idea is that this uh, S plus L maps to L, uh, N is a notation for defining a new partial function which behaves just like the old one except, except at the location L. All right, and so that's dereferencing an assignment. So we know how to actually update the store and we know how to read from the store. So how do we, how do we, uh, um, how do we handle an L gets assigned to E when E is not a value, when it's not a number? And so we'll say that L steps to E, uh, S is in the relation L steps, to, uh, transitions to L steps to E prime at S prime when E S transitions to E prime S prime. So the way you should think about this is that uh, in order to evaluate an uh, assignment statement, what we're going to do is we're going to ev evaluate the, uh, the expression we're going to store, and then we're going to keep evaluating this expression E until it reaches a numeric value N, and then we'll do the update. And the way that we, do the, we talk about this um, is by <clears throat> is by having many single steps and we justify a single step L assigned to E goes to L assigned to E prime if E steps to E prime. Likewise, we can say that uh, if you have a skip followed by an E2, that's just the same as an E2. Um, so there's skip says there's nothing to do, so we skip over it and do, we do E2. But if, if we have E1 semicolon E2 and E1 actually takes a step, well, we have, we, our single step for E1 semicolon E2 is going to be E1 prime semicolon E2. So now we've, de now we've defined how to do sequencing. And now what we can do is we can say, well, if you have a program that sets the location L to three and then dereferences L starting from a store where L gets mapped to zero, then what we will do is we can, in a sequence of three steps, we can, uh, we can take a, uh, a, 
we can eva we can we can evaluate the first uh, the first uh, component of the sequencing. So we're going to evaluate L gets set to three, and that's going to evaluate to skip, and it's up uh, going to update the store to L gets mapped to three, and then what we're going to do we're going to do is we're going to say well since skip semicolon bang l um, is a sequencing that where the first component is a skip there's a second step which takes it to bang l and then when you see a bang l you can find its value by looking it up in the store and since l is gets mapped to three we're going to return the store three and so in three steps this program, L assigned to three D reference L, is going to uh, evaluate to three with L map to three. And so again, the point is that we model the evaluation of this program as a sequence of three primitive evaluation steps. And each of these pre primitive evaluation steps is justified by building a derivation uh, of the evaluation relation using the rules for it. And so the way to think about it is that each of the, we're defining the uh, transition relation by saying that um, that uh, um, some some larger expression is in the relation just when the smaller one is. And so now we can also uh, we can also um, do the same thing for uh, for other expressions like. Uh, L gets set to three, set L to the contents of L, starting with L is assigned to zero. And so what would be good for you is to pause the video now and then try to work out what the evaluation steps for this uh, program should be and see what it steps to. And then it will first work out what is the sequence of steps it should take and then draw a little derivation tree for each of those steps. So. I'll wait for a second now while you uh, while you pause this video and then I'll carry on. Okay, so let's give this a try. So now what we're going to do is we're going to set L gets set to three and then we're going to set L to the contents of L and then we're going to have the store L maps to zero. So we can look at the operational semantics to work out what we think should happen. And so what we think should happen when you look at the rules is, okay, when you have sequencing, evaluate the first one first. So this will be the, uh, uh, the seek2 rule. And so the seek2 rule is going to say, evaluate L gets set to three. And what that's going to do is it's going to say, we're going to have skip L gets set to bang L and then we're going to have L maps to three. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say this thing uh, is going to drop the skip because we have our uh, seek, seek, uh, seek one rule. And the seek one rule says, well, when you see skip semicolon something, you just need that something. And then the uh, next rule will say, okay, when you have L gets set to a larger expression, look it up. And so this will be the assign two rule. And now the assign one rule is going to say, well, what you want to do is you want to update the store with three. And in this case, the store is already three. So we end up with skip L steps to three. And so what you can see here is in a sequence of four steps, we took the program from the original program with L mapped to zero to skip L gets uh, mapped to three. And the point is that each of these steps here is justified by a derivation relation. So we're going to have one derivation relation that looks like this. So what we want to do is we're going to use the seek2 rule here. And the seek2 rule says um, try to evaluate the first, the first component.
And the, the way that we evaluate L gets set to three is by using the assign one rule. And so the assign one rule says, well, when you have, let's look at the assign one rule. And the assign rule, one rule says, well, when you have a location and a literal numeral, then we take it to skip with the updated, uh, with the updated store. And so this is going to go to skip L maps to three. And so this will happen because of the assign one rule. And so that was our number one first. So this is our first step. Or let me write step one. And then the step, the second step is going to, so step two is going to take this expression right here. And now we're trying to look for something that skips m equal and l assigned to something uh, steps to, and we can use the seek one rule. And so we're building a derivation tree. So in this case, the derivation tree is, uh, sorry, is very small. So we look at the, we look at the root expression and it tells us immediately, okay, you have a tree of height one. And in the case of step one, we needed a tree of height two, uh, because we needed to use the seek two rule and then the assign one rule. And now, uh, and when you and the way that I'm drawing this derivation tree, um, when you reach a when you reach a root node that doesn't have it doesn't have any further premises, what we do is we uh, um, we just write it with with no with no premises over it, and so then the remaining the remaining uh, the remaining steps of this can be written out as well. Step three, so we establish this relation by, by using first the assign to rule because this expression bang L is not, a, is not a value. And then we can say bang L in this one goes to uh, 3L maps to 3, and this uses the uh, the deref rule. Let me make sure I'm using this the right name here. Yep. And then finally, what we're going to do for our final and fourth step of the evaluation is we're going to send this one to skip L maps to three. And this is because of the assign one rule. And so you, we can see that the steps of the reduction are justified by four derivation trees, one for each step of the of the evaluation of the program. And this was a common source of confusion where you write down several steps and then you somehow try to write uh, um, one derivation tree for all of those steps. That's not what you want to do. You want to write down, work out the derivation tree for each step. So you should think of the derivate of the reduction relation as one step of evaluation and the operational semantics as telling you how to derive or justify that one step of evaluation. And finally, we have what happens if we try to add 15 and the contents of L when the store is empty. And so now in this case, you'll look at the, uh, you'll say, okay, well, 15 plus something, that's going to be the uh, uh, op2 rule, and then we try to use the deref rule, and then the condition on the deref rule says, well, L has to be in the domain of S, and that's impossible. So this is going to get stuck. 
Okay, and so here's the remainder of the uh, operational semantics of the programming language. So the other thing we want to do is we're going to say for booleans, we're going to say we're going to have two reduction rules for the literal. So if we have if true, then e2 lc3, we want to take that to e2s. And if we have if false, then e2 lc 3 s, we want to take that to e3 s. And if you think about this as one step of evaluation, we're saying if it's true, take the true branch, and if it's false, take the else branch. And if e1 is not a Boolean value, then we see if e1 can take a step. So if e1 s take, goes to e1 prime uh, s prime, then if e1, then e2, else e3 s is going to go to if e1 prime, then e2, else e3 s prime. And so the way this is working is a single step of evaluation of a condition conditional is going to try to push the the thing being tested to the boolean being tested to a, a literal boolean and then finally you'll take a step to discard the uh, to discard the uh, the brand to take the right branch and discard the wrong one and the way that a while loop works is if you explain it in english so this is this is a this is a uh, a non trivial one what we're going to do is we're going to say while e1 do e2 s and so if you think about this informally what this means is um, we do the conditional test, and if the conditional test is true, we execute E2, and then we resume with the while loop. And we can render this directly into the operational semantics by saying um, while E1 do E2 S is going to step to if E1, then evaluate E2, and then repeat the while loop. And if, it, if the condition E1 is false, then we skip. So uh, this, this one requires a little bit of sitting with the first time you see it. So the informal explanation of a while loop is evaluate the loop test, run the body, and then rerun the while loop. And it's possible to turn this informal explanation directly into an operational semantics um, by saying, well, write a, do the conditional test if E1, then, if the conditional is true, evaluate E2 and follow it by the very same while loop. And if the conditional test is false, then we just skip the whole thing, which is exactly what we want. So that, that's, uh, that's really something. And so what you can do is we can look at an example, like if we initialize L2 to 0, and then while L1 is greater than or equal to 1, we do L2 gets set to L2 plus L1, decrement uh, L1. Now what we're going to see is the uh, the the, uh, the very the very thing that we talked about at the very beginning uh, when we uh, when we when we first showed you this program. So let's let's uh, let's write this down. So we have uh, L1. Oh, sorry, L2 gets set to zero, and then while uh, L1 is is greater than or equal to uh, one, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, um, we're going to set L2 to the contents of L1, uh, to L2 plus the contents of L1, and then we're going to set L1 to whatever L1 was, minus 1. And we do, we do all this in a store where uh, L1 gets mapped to 3, and L2 gets mapped to 0. And so now, in the first step, what we're going to do is we're going to step to a skip, and L2 is going to remain 0. And then this will step to a while, because the, the first skip is not needed. And then when we see the while, what we're going to do is we're going to step to a conditional. So we're going to do if L1 is greater than or equal to zero, then what we're going to do is we're going to do these two commands. 
followed by the while loop and otherwise we're going to skip and the whole thing is going to take place in the store with L1 set to 3 and L2 step, set to 0. And so now we, you, can, you can see how this is going to capture the behavior here. So we're, we want to evaluate L1 is greater than or equal to 0. So we put it in the, we, we do the dereference here. And so when you build the derivation tree for this thing, it's going to start getting quite tall. And so now this thing is going to evaluate to true. And then this thing is going to evaluate to just this branch. And now we're going to take another step where L2 gets set to L2 plus L1. Well, you have to do this in two steps. So L2 is zero. And then we evaluate L1 and that's going to be three. And now we do another step of execution, and you can see how 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 fine grained this execution is. And so now, after getting L two to three, we can actually update L two. And there is a lot of little steps that go on, one by one by one by one. And I'm going to pause here. And you can try tracing it out. Um, and one thing you'll notice is uh, we had to write quite a lot. And there's a derivation tree for every single one of these steps. Um, and there's a lot of steps that this evaluation takes. So um, you don't really want to write out the entire derivation tree in every single step in most cases. Um, but the but. You know, the, the purpose of this operational semantics is to get a computer to do it. And computers run at billions of operations per second. So it's not going to be too bothered by this. And so here's the all of L1 on a single, uh, on a single slide. Um, so we have the syntax, which is the grammar. And then we have the operational semantics, which is defining a relation by saying, here are some base cases. And then we form uh, the relation for larger terms by, by checking the uh, relation for, for smaller ones. And now what I want to talk about a little bit is how to uh, actually implement this language because you, know, you don't want to write these derivation trees by hand. And before we run it on, write a program, what we need is we need a really important property. So recall that this transition relation E1 is steps to E1 S1 is not a function. It's a relation. And so ES can be related to 0, 1 or many result configurations. And in general, you have no idea how many that is. But for L1 in particular, not for languages in general, just for L1, we can actually prove a theorem which says that if uh, E1, ES steps to E1, S1, and ES steps to E2, S2, then E1, S1 has to equal E2, S2. And what this theorem is saying is that, yes, we have a transition relation, but it, 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 this particular transition relation is deterministic. There's at most one result configuration for every initial configuration. And we'll prove this later. Um, and the fact is that having this, uh, this, uh, this property of the semantics is what makes it possible to write a very simple interpreter for it. So um, one thing we can try to do is we can look at the uh, we can look at the uh, uh, programming uh, the rules and try to use them directly. So in Prolog, this is what you would do: you would transcribe these rules into a set of clauses in Prolog, and then Prolog would try to match the initial state and the uh, resulting state uh, against the initial configuration, pick a rule, and then find the derivation tree itself. Um, and so this is. Uh, <clears throat> this is a uh, 
not a super efficient implementation strategy, but it's possible to take these formal semantics, put them into a logic programming language like Prolog or fancier ones like Lambda Prolog or 12, which are research logic programming languages, and then you can take your specification and make it directly executable. And so this is actually really useful when you're building like a conformance suite for a programming language or something like this. You, you can take the operational semantics, turn it into the implementation um, sort of on a rule by rule basis. And now a more sophisticated implementation can be tested against this reference implementation. And so in fact, um, on the web, there's a, uh, there's a low level uh, programming language for the web called WebAssembly. And it's in fact specified in this way. There's a set of reduction rules specif officially specifying the language and a uh, these reduction rules are implemented directly in a reference interpreter, and then um, proper compilers for WebAssembly are tested against this reference interpreter. Um, or uh, what you can do is you can just write an interpreter on the syntax of configurations. And this is possible because we have a determinacy theorem here. So we know that the reduction is deterministic, so we don't need to do this kind of non-deterministic matching that uh, that uh, uh, Prolog does, and that's what we'll see next when we when we see the ML-based interpreter. But there's uh, but then for real, what you can do is you can compile to a virtual machine or compile to assembly language, and you'll see this in compilers and optimizing compilers. But the, but the point is that once you have the semantics, you can tell if your uh, fancier compilation strategy actually worked. And so the idea is we're going to uh, implement an uh, interpreter and we're going to follow the definition. So we'll use ML to do this in since data types and pattern matching let us line up the program with the rules in a in a nice way. And so we have to pick representations for location stores and expressions. And so we can just take locations to be strings. Um, and the reason we're doing this is we wanted a countable set that wasn't the integers themselves. And so by choosing the strings, we have a countable set, which is not the integers. And if you try to add a three into string, you'll get a, you'll get a type error. And the store is a partial function mapping locations to integers. And we'll represent this in a sort of low tech way as a list of locations and integers. And we maintain the invariant that um, the location entries all have to be unique in this, in this mapping. And then we can give a data type for representing the BNF grammar. So we have a data type for plus or greater than or equal to, and then we have a recursive data type for expressions. And so we're going to have one clause, one variant of this data type for each of the bits of the grammar. So we will have integer, uh, integer of int, that's the N, Boolean of B, that's the B in the grammar. Um, the op E1 op E2 is op of expression oper expression. Uh, likewise for conditionals, if E1 then E2 LC3 becomes if of uh, an if an if variant that takes three expressions. And you can see you start off with these Boolean expressions and you build up larger larger expressions using using these larger constructors. And so for each element of the grammar, um, assignment, dereferencing, skip, sequencing, and while loops, there's going to be a corresponding clause of the data type. And then we're going to define a couple of auxiliary expressions to look things up in the store and to update the store. Um, and so lookup will walk through this list and give you an integer if it's there, and it's going to give you none if it's not there. And this option type recall is either none or some value. And so then what we can do is we can define a single step function, which takes an expression in the store and gives you a new expression and store if, if there is a configuration that the initial one steps to. And so the point here is this is where we're taking advantage of the determinacy of the, uh, of the semantics. So if an expression and a store, a configuration, could go to many possible configurations, then we'd need to do something fancier. Perhaps we'd need to list a return a list of configurations that a one configuration could step to. Um, but because the transition relation is deterministic, we can just return an option. So we give, we'll give you, you'll either give you back the the new trans configuration, or we'll tell you none, saying there's no transition from this. 
And so the way that we do, we do this is we pattern match on the operator and the store, and we say, okay, well, when you see an integer or a Boolean, these are both values, so there's no, tra no, no transition from them. And then when you see an operator, op e1, o, o e2, um, what we're going to do is we're going to do pattern matching. So if you see integer n1 plus integer n2, then we can implement the uh, the the op plus one rule or the op one rule. And if you see uh, a greater than or equal to in two integers, we can implement the uh, the comparison rule. And then you're, we're going to see something interesting for these other rules. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a series of tests. We can say, well, is it is E1 a value? If it is, then we evaluate E2. And uh, we have, uh, there's two things you, you, we, we need to notice. Um, actually, let me bring up the whole, uh, the whole reduction relation here because it, it's helpful to actually see it. Um, So what's going on here? Let's look at uh, uh, let's look at operators here. Okay. For some reason, my formatting got a little messed up. Okay. And so what I want to do is I want to look at the 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 reductions here and so we have this we have this nest of tests we say okay we see e1 op e2 and we say is e1 a value if e1 is a value and e2 reduces to some e2 prime s prime then we return op e1 op e2 prime and so this implements the op2 rule and if e1 is not a value then uh what we will do is we will try and reducing e1 and if e1 successfully reduces then we apply that then we can reduce evaluate this to op e1 prime op e2 s prime and so this this branch of the conditional implements the op1 rule and so and so what we what we're doing is these uh, these four operator rules are implemented with a series of tests. We're testing uh, whether we had two integers and and an operate and uh, operator either plus or greater than or equal to. And then if they're not integers, then we're doing a test to see if e1 is a value, and if so, we're implementing op2 and likewise for op1. So you can see that the the mapping is. Um, straightforward, but not quite one to one, because you have to you have to uh, you have to do these tests to to figure out which which rule that you need to apply in each case. Okay, and so similarly for assignment, you're going to see the same kind of behavior here. You're going to do a test for on e to see if it's an integer, and if it is an integer, you can update the store, and if it's not an integer. Uh, or sorry, if the update isn't possible because the location wasn't in it, we return none. We're in a stuck state, and otherwise we try to evaluate. Uh, we try to evaluate uh, e, and if it takes a step, then we we go from l e s to l e prime s prime. So this is implementing the assign to rule, and if it didn't take a step, then it was stuck, and we return none. And once you have implemented this uh, this rule, then you can implement an evaluate rule, which works in a in a rather in a rather simple way. It just recursively applies reduct the single step reduction until it reaches a stuck stuck state. And if it does, and if the program runs forever like a while loop, then it's not going to return ever. So if you have while true do skip, it's just going to run forever. Okay, and so we'll have one demo, and then we'll be uh, then we'll be uh, ready to wrap this up. So let's take a look at it. So we have this. So let's load, 
And so now let's look at a program right here. So we're going to have a simple program and what this one is going to do is it's going to assign L1 to 3 and then dereference L1 starting in a store where L1 is 0. So if you want to think about it this way, what it is is it's starting with the configuration L, L1 gets set to 3 followed by dereference L1 and the store is L1 maps to uh, 0. And so what we expect here is we expect for this to go to uh, skip. So let's do do it. Uh, what it's going to do is it's going our our reduction sequence is going to be what we expect. So we get L1 gets assigned to 3 L1. It gets set to skip L, uh, dereference L1 in a new in a new store where L1 is 3 and then we drop the skip and we dereference L1 and then de looking up L1 in this new modified store we get 3 and then we're finished with a value. All right. And so that's what that's how this kind of program works. And I, I heartily recommend to you that you download this interpreter and try it out and read the code as well and try to connect it up to the, uh, connect it up to the, uh, um, the, uh, to the inference rules. So, so with that, thank you. And in the next lecture, we'll start looking at how we actually prove things mathematically about, uh, about semantics.